What is up, dweebs, and welcome to this special little bonus episode of Han Shot First. I am Kev without my two wonderful co-hosts because they did their homework and I did not. So because math is not my strong suit, I had to come back and watch Andor episode 10. And I wanted to talk to all of you about it to keep the show on the track. So for our last two episodes, we'll be discussing the final arc, final two episode arc of Andor. And then of course, the entire series itself. So stay tuned for that. Please like subscribe if you would. Uh, subscription will keep you notified once we go live next Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. So shout out to everyone at Han Shot First. James, John, can't wait to see you folks with us next Wednesday. Of course, it's brought to you by Bite Size Sports, but I am done with my ad reads, okay? Episode 10 of Andor, the end of the prison break arc was very, very good in my humble opinion. So I thoroughly enjoyed some of the symmetry with this, uh, some of that you know, sort of like poetry and that they rhyme situation. Uh, we'll go into those examples as we uh, go through my notes here. Now, this will not be a beat by beat. And then they did this. And here's an Easter egg for that. I mean, those guys over at Screen Crush, New Rock Stars. I don't even know if Heavy Spoilers was doing this kind of stuff when Andor came out. But I know that Screen Crush and New Rock Stars have been vital for me personally in helping to bridge gaps between Andor and Rogue One and or episode four because i haven't been watching all of that stuff simultaneously to keep up with the show so those easter egg videos are incredibly helpful so if you ha somehow haven't heard of those channels before go check them out give them a like and a subscribe and maybe tell them that dweeb sent you i don't know just a little uh, uh a little thank you to them from us here at dweeb because i know the other guys check out some of their videos too so anyway let's get into the episode itself, Kino finally caves and is ready to lead the escape of his crew and what will inevitably become everyone. Also, that's our spoiler alert, spoiler warning. It feels odd to have to do that for a show that's been around for so long, but here we are. You know, I don't know why you'd be clicking on this video if you didn't want things spoiled for you, but it feels like an obligation that I... I need to follow through on that. So, okay, spoilers, we good? All right, thank you. This next moment, this quote I'm going to discuss with you guys was one of my favorites in what has been so far a series full of favorites for me. When Andor says, I'd rather die trying to take them down than giving them what they want. A, is that not what Luthen has been begging for and kind of pushing for? throughout not just cassian but throughout the universe when he's leading up to this you know oppression breeds rebellion that talk he had with saw things like that he's he's mentioned it multiple times in different situations throughout the series so seeing that to me that was the moment that was the birth of the rebellion hero cassian andor right there uh, in that moment when he made that statement sort of it almost felt subconsciously reminded me of a bit that gets done in the squared circle an old wrestling every once in a while, not nearly to the believability of this extent here, but you get two people fired up. And then one of them gets so angry and emotional that they slip up and they accept the challenge that's been put out in front of them that they've been avoiding this whole time. And then this is sort of what it felt like, you know, Andor, who's had all these opportunities to be a rebel, but hasn't really cared. It's really only been about himself. Uh, it wasn't until he faced a true injustice where he wasn't, he hadn't actually done anything wrong. And then he loses his millions of credits, whatever his cut was, and then gets put in that situation. We all know what happened with Olaf that triggered Kino, but I think that maybe also is what led to and or going from I want to get out of here just to get out of here to I'm going to get out of here and when I'm done 
I'm going to continue to fight against this empire. So I really enjoyed that part. There will be other moments where it comes back. I mean, Kino uses that in his epic speech. So uh, I, I love that it resonates and has that sort of uh, cyclical effect. Maybe part of this is because I've been watching Loki at the same time to gear up for a Loki review on Dweeb. And so maybe that's giving me an extra appreciation for some of that in this show because I just uh, it's uh, I'm immersed in all this symmetry. Uh, it's fantastic. Something that's a little less fantastic for the rebellion, however, is when one of Krieger's pilots is captured. They use Dr. G's horrible, uh, I can't remember what the race, uh, the species was that was uh, horribly slaughtered by the Empire. They're using the sound of uh, what the doctor believes is uh, they're, they're young, dying. God, I mean, yeah, please like and subscribe, man. We got to get a Patreon up. We're, we're not going to be able to monetize this. Anyway, they use that sound to uh, torture. Might as well. Might as well say torture. We're here now. The, <laughs> um, the pilot who gives up the plans. And at that point... Uh, moving further on see i told you we're not going to go beat by beat we're going to stick with some plot threads here uh deidre and lonnie are with the head of the isb discussing what they should do and it is lonnie that says well hey we should act the way we would normally act otherwise they may be suspicious you know they'll maybe then they would know that something's up because if you remember uh and, and i had missed mentioning this just a moment ago not only do they find this pilot he gives everything up but they then uh kill the pilot and set it up to look like there was some sort of malfunction which again yikes this the isb gives me the willies because uh you know those alf three letter alphabet agencies you know at least thank god none of ours do stuff like that right guys thank god Thank God nobody uh, takes out any folks and stages it to look like accidents in our world. I'm so glad that that doesn't happen. Oof, fiction can be a scary place. Gives me the willies. Uh, <laughs> Krieger's pilot's captured and succumbs. Uh, but that scene with Lonnie, you know, Mora, her eye lingers on him a little bit. We notice that the head of the ISB doesn't take her tablet. He kind of is listening to Lonnie more. And then the camera lingers on him as well gee oh, i wonder i wonder if lonnie's going to come back you know we've only been dealing with certain members of this isb roundtable you know a lot of them to me at least remain basically nameless and faceless there are probably some deep cuts in there i'm sure the lore meisters are uh know who everyone that's in that room i don't but it's a nice little foreshadowing that we're going to come back to Lonnie. Uh, Mon Mothma and Davo scene was another. Again, I mentioned before, this is an episode that gave me a lot of favorites in a show. that has, This might be my favorite episode so far in the show because it just had so many of these, in my opinion, just well done eye on the detail moments and scenes that I think future Star Wars projects will be chasing for years to come. I think uh, in a few years from now, when people look back on Andor, and it'll yeah, it'll be that threshold. It'll be that watermark that everyone's trying to get to. You know, oh, this is better than that Mon Mothma Davo scene was in Andor. So to let's talk about why I like it so much. How about that? It was. Fun to read between the lines. Now, again, shout out to Screen Crush, who did his own version of reading between the lines, sort of deciphering each line, going line by line to do it. So I'm not going to do that for you. It's already been done. I think I might have had some slight tweaks to how I personally would have interpreted that. But I think that's the fun in it. That's what's great about having them speak in their sort of code where they're both being polite, but there's some bite to it. You know, both parties, all three parties, if you include Tay, he gets involved a little bit. 
they seem to understand what's being said underneath the surface but it's just this uh this veneer of uh, pomp and professionalism and it's that veneer that davo wants as a you know sort of crime boss a big rich guy a thug a gangster what do those people want normally credibility makes it a lot easier to do some of the dirty things if you're plugged into the government and you have now friends in high places to go along with your garth brooks friends in low places and you can really start to make some things happen if you're a man or a woman in davo's position or you know insert however many different star wars beings there could be so another level or layer to this scene that was great is how that conversation uh, davo is using it not only to try to uh, get more information out of what she needs and why but to plant the seeds for what his ask is going to be you know talking about how he uh, appreciates the clarity of their uh, i wanted to say country their planets the chandrillion ways um about having the arranged marriage at 15 and he at some point mentions oh i i know your husband and she shoots that down with i'm sure you know just kind of oh in your yeah of course, i'm sure you would he's a scumbag like you and then when he says you know i i assume that's not a corner we're going to turn in this conversation she says no which is again i'm not gonna do the whole thing but you know she's basically laying it down families off off the table but then you you see why because he doesn't want any money in return he has all the money he needs what he needs is influence what he needs is power what he needs are favors that he can cash in and what better way to have a running ticket you know take a number here for your favors than to have your child marry that senator's child and so the one thing he asks for is a return invitation to bring his 14 year old son to meet her 13 year old daughter i would imagine based on mon mothma getting married when she was 15 uh, that would give us one way or another i don't know if they both have to be 15 uh, we'd have one or two years uh, approximately before those two families are then merged and i think more importantly on mon mothma's side despite the fact that her daughter's a teenager and hates her guts and seems to be siding only with her dad because he from what we can lay out he probably doesn't seem to give a shit and also is also probably taking as many opportunities as he can to pit his daughter their daughter against her mother uh, so he can sort of win that battle at home too but despite all that mon mothma is not willing to marry her daughter off in a situation that you know she may regret having had done to her you know she doesn't want to do that to her daughter and says she's not even thinking about it and, and davo says that's the first unhonest thing she said since they got there and that's a, a very neat cap to uh what i overall one of my favorite scenes in this episode uh, sort of just showing how smart he is intuitive he is despite being one of the uh scummier characters in the universe and knowing that damn right despite what mon mothma says i think we all know that the level of rebellion what this show has been showing us throughout 10 episodes and what luthan will later get into in his monologue which is you know it everything ties in that's what i love about the multiple stories that go on in andor the the themes stick together they've timed things well they've paced things out so that in the same episode where luthan talks about how he's sacrificed his humanity uh and any hope of being calm of having any sort of love in his life and, and acknowledges that in order to try to defeat his enemy he's become his enemy and the very ground that he used to stand on essentially his morals you know the things the manifesto that he had built it doesn't exist anymore because in order for him to uh, shed that light for future generations he has to play in the mud he has to do those evil things and sacrifice what makes him human and they parallel that 
with there being 50 men in Krieger's unit, the same number of men on a shift at the prison. You know, we see the enemy is willing to fry a hundred people to keep a secret. Luthen is willing to sacrifice 50 men to keep a secret. How different are they here? And that's what this whole episode does a great job. This whole show does a great job of. And when you have Mon Mothma in a situation where we all know she actually really is going to have to consider this thing with Davo, lest she have her cover blown, we all also know that eventually she will be a leader on the rebellion. So we, we know that this turn is coming, but we don't expect it to be happening now. So I, in my opinion, opinion i think she is going to end up selling that part of her soul unfortunately and it will be just one other thing that motivates her and pushes her towards this rebellion because she also has the talks with her cousin vel who of course retroactively it makes that scene between sent and vel when sent says well i can just pretend i'm a rich girl running away from her family or so and you know bell's like that's cold even for you you know i love how these uh this is a great great job by this show of setting things up and then paying them off later not something that all of these disney shows whether it be on the star wars or the marvel side they're not always great at that sometimes those uh that happens for reasons outside of the studio and the showrunners control i'll acknowledge that but it's happened enough times to where it also is a bit of a flaw in in normal shows. The show does a great job of keeping that going. So I uh, just, again, uh, to put a bookend on the whole Mon Mothma run in this episode, it, it has been very fun for me to watch. If you've watched other episodes of Han Shot First, you know that I actually love the political intrigue. Uh, it's a genre of fiction I don't particularly hate you know it's not something i'll read all the time like if it's i'm not going to read uh too much of the uh americanized uh, political stuff but in in my fantasy worlds i actually really like uh, having that level that depth to the universe you know it's one of the reasons i like dune uh one of the reasons i love star wars is just it's so much depth if the universe feels lived in when you have this much politics involved i think that's why another reason why people liked game of thrones uh well there's a lot okay another reason why i liked game of thrones how about that i think there's a lot of other reasons <laughs> casual fans love game of thrones as well but uh, and it probably wasn't the political intrigue so i might be <laughs> in the minority there so let's acknowledge it uh back to the escape sequence it was incredibly well done it was very tense and i i I like the double entendres of having a new man on the floor hold position so kino is not only acting out his role as he does throughout the day leading up to uh, the escape you know talking about i'm not going to be behind you know just doing a great job of being who he normally would be on a day but it's also sort of a hold your fire men situation and uh, another tip of the cap in the escape scene, escape sequence, which I'll acknowledge part of it is, you know, they know what they're riding up toward. They know they're riding toward Rogue One, toward Episode Four. So, you know, or you assume not everyone's going to make it out because you're like, well, I haven't seen some of these characters. They're making out to be important. But because it's a prison escape, you can hold on hope that any of them could get out and just leave the story you know they don't have to all perish and the show did in my opinion a good job of taking out zal i can't remember the name of the character unfortunately that uh was always part of planning the escape with andor um he got shot while he was trying to climb up the platform so but they had yeah characters that you spent a lot of time with on this arc that you came to like that were a big part um Zal's sacrifice in particular uh, his th- he throws a rod at a guard and gets shot by the other guard but uh, him throwing that causing that guard to dodge and move closer to the rail is what allows Andor to get his leg knock him out punch him in the head and and that great sequence where he fires the low blaster round and hits the other guard in the ankle and takes him down so it was just great uh, to see. Uh, it was a fun set piece. I enjoyed it. 
wasn't sure where they were going with that whole water pipe at first i i genuinely just thought that was something he was doing to just plan and escape i I have no idea i didn't think they were trying to get the bathroom to flood to overload the circuit so uh, it was a fun sequence overall despite the unfortunate deaths Uh, and when they get to the voice room the main room And you see it's really just a a bunch of sheepish drones that can't think for themselves and don't really know what to do. Thought that was a good take on the Empire. Love the voice modulator and Andy Serkis doing that. Uh, It was was a great monologue to me. It was well done because, you know, it started off so poorly and then he worked his way up and tapped into what he'd been doing this whole time to get through that shift and to try to have one of the best teams. He, he used that skill, you know, it's uh, that he acquired. He, maybe he had it before, but it's no doubt that he honed and, and uh, sharpened those skills at his time in the prison. So there was that sense of the empire kind of building, just like always kind of building the things that lead to its ultimate demise uh, so it, it was again, sort of like poetry and, <laughs> but seeing Kinu, uh, use that to motivate the rest of the men to escape was fantastic, especially once you find out that Kino can't swim. So maybe there's a possibility at least, cause we don't really know at what point Kino realized that that's going to be the only way out. Maybe part of their original exit strategy was there would be some ships they could take. No, no idea. They don't really talk about that. They don't specifically tell you in the lead in or the build up to the heist that, Hey, we're going to be jumping out and swimming. So it's possible that Kino doesn't realize this until they get to the end. And then he has that moment, which I do love where even though he can't go, there's a bit of a smile on his face, a sense of pride. Uh, it, Star Wars hasn't strayed away from its religious imagery, and that sort of reminds me of the story of Moses. You know, the, n- not being able to see the promised land for yourself. But what I was getting at is that it is possible that Kino knew this the entire time. You know, he knew he couldn't swim. He knew it was run off Hydra. He knew about everything an inmate could know about this place. I'm not saying he knew these things. I'm saying it's, it's possible that he knew all these things. Uh, it's possible that he knew they were in the middle of an ocean and that there was no way his ass was getting anywhere, even if they did escape, which would then make his sacrifice and his struggle to get out that speech just that much uh, more moving to me personally. So let's move to the final moving piece of the episode before I spend the episode's entire runtime talking about it. Lonnie is in the elevator talking to Luthen, talking about how he has to quit now because he's got a little child. Now, well, Luthen knows all about the child. Luthen knows about everything. It's creepy. Again, to show that how much different is Luthen from his enemy. You know, their, their ultimate goals are the complete opposite, but their methods are far too similar uh, for, I'm sure someone like Lonnie to be any kind of comfortable. And while telling Luthen that he has to quit, Lonnie essentially is trying to give him some farewell information. Like, Hey, I'm going to tell you this. And then uh, I'm out. It was my farewell gift to you. He tells him about them discovering Krieger's pilot, capturing him, getting all the information they know about Spellhouse, I think it's called. And they're come. They're going to set up an ambush. Your boys are cooked. You got to tell them. You got to tell them it's off. And Luthen points out that then someone will know that there's a mole in the ISB. And what we know as the audience, Luthen may know it himself, but we know that Lonnie was one of two people in there with the ISB chief. You can't get much closer. You can't get much more intel than Lonnie is able to provide. So 
big picture makes sense that Luthen is saying, well, these 50 men, someone who it's been set up by Saul, that he's slow and dumb. Of course, Luthen called him strong as well, but it's sort of has the stage has kind of been set. They're like, oh, yeah, well, this guy and his 50 men, there's a bunch of different pockets of rebellion. Yeah, that's not worth it. That's not worth the sacrifice of maybe having to change people out in the ISB and then losing that access and then not being able to see something bigger, something worse. Uh, it's it's has to be a difficult thing to manage in a gray area, but that's what I love about a good spy tale. That's some good spy craft right there. Sometimes you just have to make the right decision for the greater good and it's, gross doesn't make you feel good again there's so many parallels to just watching the end of loki and watching this can't wait to talk to you guys about that show so make sure you like and subscribe but luthan tells lonnie that he can't leave and lonnie essentially is like what do you what would you know about sacrifice what have you sacrificed and that's what gets into the monologue of all monologues for this show another moment that i think future star wars shows will have to work their way up to you know something they will try to emulate emulate or surpass that luthan monologue talking about all the things that he had to give up which essentially breaks down to his very humanity and i i strongly suggest somehow if you're one of the folks that wants to know the lore and doesn't watch the episodes and so you've added this to your rotation of screen crush new rock stars heavy spoilers emergency awesome and you're just like, hey, I just want to know as much as I can without watching these shows. Well, then, hey, that's that's cool, too, man. Free time is limited. I get it. But I strongly urge you to go back and just, A, watch this whole episode. But go find this monologue. It's essentially the final scene. There's one more. It cuts to the final scene in a neat little transition we'll talk about here shortly. But, yeah, I would say go watch the Luthan monologue. I don't want to ruin it for anyone who hasn't seen it in its entirety but it is epic him listing out the sacrifices and then saying no you'll stay with me Lonnie I need all the heroes I can get and then it immediately cuts to Andor and his homie another Rogue One character running out of prison towards the moons in the sky and uh, the show has done a great job at times of have you know we've talked about the multiple storylines and they'll cut from one and the way that scene ends is is very relatable it's like a perfect segue into what the theme of that next scene is going to be like i said there's lots of shared themes amongst the subplots that tie together in this show just very well done so i enjoyed it we're almost at the 30 minute mark here so this is about half of an episode of the dweeb well, not the Dweeb podcast. Well, about, yeah, about, but about about half an episode of Han Shot first. And speaking of the Dweeb podcast, we will have the flagship Dweeb podcast coming back very soon. So once again, that'd be a great reason to turn those notifications on once you have subscribed. We thank you so very much. It's wonderful to have you guys hanging out with us. If you like uh, what you heard and you want to hear me talk about other things, you can follow me on Twitter at KevNevik underscore. I have my comedy podcast that is run by my dear friend danny the clout route i am on there with him every tuesday and sunday from 6 p.m to 8 p.m eastern so go check that out we have a blast calling out scammers grifters internet clowns anybody trying to do something in the name of chasing the clout route uh, you can also find me on bite size sports every thursday at 9 p.m eastern with james from on shot first and our dear friend keebler and Keebler is also on our NFL show on Bite Size Sports, uh, Necessary Roughness, which is hosted by our other Han Shot First co-host, Johnny NFL. So go check those out. If you uh, come there directly from this video, please tell them that Kev sent you. I would love that. Uh, we love to support each other over there on Bite Size Sports, and we would love your support as well. Uh, if you're into fighting, I do a podcast every Monday on Carnage Media called Carnage Unleashed. I am a play-by-play -play analyst, a color commentator, not an analyst, an announcer, a commentator for 
Carnage Media. I guess I do some analysis on the podcast, but mainly do the play-by-play calling for our pay-per-views. So you can follow them at Carnage Media PPV to stay up to date with our newest stuff. And, you know, we've got some surprises in the works, some new things coming. So I would make sure you're following on social media to be updated when that can be news because I can't really tell you about it now. So anyway, thank you all so much for watching. I appreciate you. And as James would say, remember, Han shot first.